I recently watched a group of protesters, most of them young, denouncing President Donald Trump's immigration policies. They were waving Mexican flags and shouting, Si, si puede! Yes, we can. This is now the rallying cry of the open borders left, but it wasn't always. In fact, I wondered if a single person at the protest knew where it came from. The slogan first became famous 50 years ago, thanks to Cesar Chavez. He was the founder of the United Farm Workers Union. When Chavez said, si se puede, he meant something very different. Yes, we can seal the borders. Cesar Chavez hated illegal immigration. He was Hispanic, obviously, and definitely on the left, but he fought to keep illegal Mexican immigrants out of this country. He understood that peasants from Latin America will always work for less than Americans will. That's why employers prefer them. Chavez knew that. As long as we have a poor country bordering California, he once explained, it's going to be very difficult to win strikes. In 1969, Chavez led a march down the center of California to protest the hiring of illegal immigrant produce pickers. Marching alongside him was Democratic Senator Walter Mondale and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the longtime aide to Martin Luther King. Ten years later, Chavez dispatched armed union members into the desert to assault Mexican nationals who were trying to sneak across the border. Chavez's men beat immigrants with chains and whips made of barbed wire. Illegal aliens who dared to work as scabs had their houses firebombed and their cars burned. Chavez wasn't embarrassed about any of this. He bragged about it. No matter. Chavez remains a progressive hero. President Obama declared his birthday a commemorative federal holiday. It's an official day off in a half a dozen states. There's a college named after him and dozens of public schools. Cesar Chavez's life is a reminder of how much the left has changed and how quickly. Until recently, most Democrats agreed with Chavez. They opposed unchecked immigration because they knew it hurt American workers, and they were right. One study by a Harvard economist examined the effects of the mass migration of Cuban refugees to this country in 1980, the so-called Mariel Boatlift. He found that American workers in Miami with a high school education saw their wages fall by more than 30% after the refugees arrived. If you believe in supply and demand, this is not surprising. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, Democratic Governor Jerry Brown opposed letting Vietnamese refugees into California on the grounds that the state already had enough poor people. As he put it at the time, there's something a little strange about saying, let's bring in 500,000 more people when we can't take care of the 1 million Californians out of work. First-term Senator Joe Biden of Delaware agreed. He introduced federal legislation to curb the arrival of the Vietnamese. Two decades later, leading Democrats were still wary of mass immigration, especially illegal immigration. As Bill Clinton put it in the 1995 State of the Union address, Americans are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public services they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. No prominent Democrat would say anything like that today without being denounced as a racist. Clinton got a standing ovation. As late as 2006, there were still liberals who cared about the economic effects of immigration, legal or illegal. Immigration reduces the wages of domestic workers who compete with immigrants, explained economist Paul Krugman in the New York Times. We'll need to reduce the inflow of low-skilled immigrants. Mainly that means better controls on illegal immigration. That same year, Senator Hillary Clinton voted for a fence on the Mexican border. So did Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and 23 other Senate Democrats. Not anymore. 20 years after Bill Clinton told Americans they had the right to be upset about illegal immigration, his wife scolded the country for enforcing border controls. So what changed? Not the economics of it. The law of supply and demand remained in effect. It's not a coincidence that as illegal immigration surged, wages for American workers stagnated. What changed is that Democrats stopped caring about those workers, about the middle class, really. Why? Here's the answer in four simple facts. One, according to a recent study from Yale, there are at least 22 million illegal immigrants living in the United States. Two, Democrats plan to give all of them citizenship. Read the Democrats' 2016 party platform. Three, studies show the overwhelming majority of first-time immigrant voters vote Democrat. Four, the biggest landslide in American presidential history was only 17 million votes. Do the math. The payoff for Democrats? Permanent electoral majority for the foreseeable future. In a word, power. That's the point, no matter what they tell you. American workers, be damned. I'm Tucker Carlson. 
Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These poetic lines, engraved on a bronze plaque beneath the Statue of Liberty, speak to who we are, a nation of immigrants, until now. As Senate Democrat Chuck Schumer lamented, tears are running down the cheeks of the Statue of Liberty. We've turned our backs on those huddled masses, closed our borders, separated families, hardened our hearts. Or so you would think if you only read the headlines or watch TV news. Just one problem, it's not true. The United States still maintains the most generous immigration policies in the world. Generous to a fault, because the overwhelming numbers have stymied our ability to assimilate the huddled masses. 50 million residents of America are foreign-born. In fact, today the United States has more immigrants as a percentage of its total population than at any time since 1890. That's why, to give one illustration, 176 different languages are spoken among students in the New York City school system. How did we get here? For starters, America grants permanent residents to a million people every single year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because of something you've probably heard referred to as chain migration. Chain migration allows immigrants to sponsor not only their immediate family, parents, spouses, and children under age 21, but much of their extended family once they gain citizenship, unmarried adult children and any children they might have, married adult children and their children, and brothers and sisters and their children. Princeton University researchers, using the most recently available data, found that immigrants sponsored an average of 3.45 additional relatives each. So the 1 million immigrants granted permanent residence each year potentially adds, over time, another 3.5 million. In addition, an estimated 100,000 refugees and asylum seekers, people who claim to be fleeing political or personal strife abroad, enter the country annually. From 2008 to 2017, the U.S. gave green cards to well over a million people for humanitarian reasons, allowing them to live and work here permanently. After five years, they can apply for full citizenship. We're not done yet. In that same time frame, nearly half a million more people came to America through the Diversity Visa Lottery, a program designed to admit more people from underrepresented countries into the U.S. Diversity visa applicants don't need a high school education, job skills, or pretty much anything. And thanks again to chain migration, spouses and unmarried children under 21 of visa lottery winners also get to come to America. This nonstop flow of new legal immigrants, based on family ties instead of skills, abilities, and allegiance to American values, has of course been supplemented by millions who enter the country illegally and stay illegally. Dominant media outlets use the euphemism undocumented, but the official U.S. government term, used in federal statutes, is illegal alien, an unlawful entrant who came without permission and stays in open defiance of our laws. The number of illegal aliens in the country is usually given as 11 million. But have you noticed that number never seems to change? Common sense suggests it's higher, much higher. And though illegal aliens themselves don't qualify for welfare, they receive free health care in our clinics and hospitals, and through their American-born children, they can expect to receive all manner of benefits, cash aid, food stamps, and housing vouchers. Their children are entitled to a free education in public schools. Building a high-tech border barrier would certainly help stem this flow. Ending chain migration is another obvious remedy. E-Verify, the national database that allows employers to check workers' immigration status, is also essential. So is a fully functioning entry-exit system to track visa overstayers. But all solutions will ultimately fail unless we get control of the numbers and enforce our laws consistently. It's Sovereignty 101. This is our home, and we have not only the right, but the responsibility to determine who comes in, how many come in, and what qualities and qualifications they bring. The truth is, we let in millions, and of course, millions more want to come. Who can blame them? But it's simply not possible or desirable to let in everyone. And it's not hateful to say so. It's not hateful to protect our borders. It's not hateful to protect our citizens. It's not hateful to protect our values. 
Lady Liberty may be shedding tears, not because we've stopped welcoming immigrants, but because our ill-conceived immigration policies are threatening the American dream. I'm Michelle Malkin, CRTV host and author of Invasion and Sold Out for Prager University. Every sensible immigration policy has two objectives. One, to regain control of our borders so that we decide who enters, and two, to find a humane way to deal with the 11 million illegal immigrants who now live among us. Start with the second. For both practical and moral reasons, America cannot and will not and should not expel 11 million people. That leaves us with two choices. Ignore them or figure out a way to legalize them. Ignoring them hasn't worked. But there's also a huge problem with legalization. It creates an irresistible incentive for new illegal immigrants to come. We say, of course, that this will be the very last, very final, never again, we're not kidding this time, amnesty. And everyone knows it's phony. That's what was said in 1986 when we passed the Simpson-Mazzoli immigration reform. It turned out to be the largest legalization program in American history. Nearly three million people got permanent residency. There was no enforcement. We now have 11 million new illegal immigrants in our midst. The irony of this whole debate, which bitterly splits the country, is that there is a silver bullet that would not just solve the problem, but also create a national consensus behind it. A vast number of Americans who oppose legalization and fear new waves of immigration would change their minds if we could radically reduce new, i.e. future, illegal immigration. And we can. First, build a barrier. Call it a wall, call it a fence, call it what you will. Add cameras and sensors, add drones, beef up the patrols. All that matters is that we regain control of the border. Fences work. The triple fence outside San Diego led to a 90% reduction in infiltration. Israel's border fence with the West Bank produced a similar decline. Even holier-than-thou Europeans have conceded the point. Hungary, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Austria, Greece, Spain, why even Norway have all started building border fences to stem the tide of Middle Eastern refugees. Then enforce two other measures, a national e-verify system that makes it just about impossible to work if you are here illegally, and a functioning visa tracking system since 40% of illegal immigrants are visa overstays. The wall fence will, of course, be ugly. So are the concrete barriers to keep truck bombs from driving into the White House. Sometimes function has to supersede form. And don't tell me that this is our Berlin Wall. When you build a wall to keep people in, that's a prison. When you build a wall to keep people out, that's an expression of sovereignty. Of course, no barrier will be foolproof, but it doesn't have to be. It simply has to reduce the river to a manageable trickle. Once we do, everything becomes possible, including dealing with our 11 million illegal immigrants. So let's fix that. Track the visas, do we verify, build the damn barrier. It's ridiculous to say that it can't be done. And who would certify that the border is back in our control? I would have a neutral party, perhaps a commission of retired jurists, issue the judgment. Once they do, we legalize the 11 million, granting them the right to stay and work here. We can't give them citizenship. That's a bridge too far. You don't get to join the political destiny of the country by entering it illegally. But any children born here would be American, which means that over time, the issue resolves itself. The American people are legitimately angry at the price American society has paid due to illegal immigration. But they are also a generous people. Once they're assured that we do indeed control our borders, that anger will abate. A national consensus will emerge. Radical border control followed by radical legalization. No mushy compromise. 
A solution requires two acts of national will. Putting up a wall along with E-Verify and visa tracking and absorbing those who broke our laws to come to America. This is not a compromise meant to appease both sides without achieving anything. It's not some piece of hybrid legislation that arbitrarily divides illegals into those with five-year-old roots in America and those without, or some such mischief-making nonsense. If we do it right, not only will we solve the problem, we will get it done as one nation. I'm Charles Krauthammer for Prager University. I am the proud son of immigrants from Bangladesh. I was raised in New York City, which has benefited enormously from the energy and ambition of the millions of people born abroad who've chosen to make it their home. But I also believe that America's immigration system needs to work for America. And right now, that is simply not the case. We need a new immigration system. So what should it be? We're often presented with two stark choices, severe restrictions or open borders. I think there's a better way. But before I offer a solution, let's look at the usual suspects. The case for open borders is, on the surface, pretty attractive. Tens of millions of people around the world would be grateful to come to America for the chance to live in peace and earn a decent living. The vast majority of them mean us no harm. Why not give them a chance to share in the blessings of liberty? The simple answer is that our country is more than just a marketplace. We're a democracy based on a social contract. Americans pay taxes so that, among other things, the poorest, most unlucky among us can still lead decent and dignified lives. If you can't work, you might be eligible for unemployment benefits or disability. If you do work, but your paycheck doesn't go far enough for you to afford medical care or food for your kids, we have a safety net designed to help you stay afloat. Liberals and conservatives disagree on how extensive this safety net ought to be, but they all agree it needs to be there. The question is, how far are we willing to stretch it? A century ago, immigrants who found they couldn't make it in America had little choice but to go back home. That is no longer the case. These days, immigrants who can't earn enough to support their families have access to many government benefits. That doesn't make them bad people. In an age of offshoring and automation, wages for menial jobs don't go very far. If we only admitted a modest number of low-skill immigrants, say as political refugees, we could easily handle it. But over the past 40 years, we have allowed millions of low-skill immigrants into the country, both legally and illegally. While highly educated immigrants pay far more in taxes than they consume in benefits, the opposite is true of immigrants with less than a high school diploma. Immigrant engineers working for Google, Amazon, and Apple do just fine without government help. The immigrant janitors and busboys who serve them struggle to afford housing and to give their kids a decent start in life. Without government aid, many would go hungry. If we were to open our borders, the number of low-skilled immigrants would skyrocket, and so too would the cost of meeting their needs. Ironically, this would only exacerbate the wealth disparity that so animates the open borders crowd. Maybe the rich could wall themselves off in gated communities. But the growing ranks of the poor and even the middle class would have to deal with ever more strained social services. That could provoke resentment strong enough to set off real class warfare. If open borders are a bad idea, so too is severely restricting immigration. For one, immigration has always been part of the American story, and it continues to be an essential source of talent, from Silicon Valley to medicine to pro sports. Why shut ourselves off from the dynamism and energy that immigrants can bring? Thankfully, there is a way to fix this problem. We can modernize the system to give priority to those who have strong skills and job offers. People, in other words, who will pay more in taxes than they need in benefits. Today, we admit about two-thirds of immigrants on the basis of family ties and only 15% on the basis of skills. We need a course correction. We should limit family immigration to immediate family members, such as spouses and minor children, while greatly expanding the number of skills-based visas. 
a skills-based point system would be a huge boon for people around the world looking to live the American dream. It would give them a predictable, step-by-step -step guide for how to better their chances at a green card. Just as importantly, by prioritizing immigrants with strong skills, we'd make the safety net much easier to sustain for those with low skills whom we'd still admit, albeit at a more modest level. Let's announce to the world that if you're ambitious, if you have skills we prize, the golden door is open. If you can support yourself and your family and add to our economy, we want you. If we aspire to an immigration system that works, this is the most realistic and idealistic choice. I'm Raihan Salam, Executive Editor of National Review for Prager University. I picked a fine time to become an American. It was a gray, overcast morning in Oakland, California. I was one of 1,094 people of every color and creed from 85 nations, beginning with Afghanistan and ending with Yemen. We had gathered, anxiously clutching the requisite documents, outside the rather antique Paramount Cinema. I wasn't the only new citizen of European origin, but we were a distinct minority. Rather to my surprise, the Chinese were the most numerous group, accounting for close to a fifth of the new Americans. How many Americans became Chinese citizens that week? Next were the Mexicans, more than 150 of them, then the Filipinos, closely followed by the Indians. Yet it was the sheer range of countries represented that was most marvelous. The young man to my right, immaculately dressed in white, was from Eritrea. He had studied computer science in Wales and had initially come to California to work for NASA. I approach any encounter with US bureaucracy weighed down by dread. So, I wondered, would this be like the Department of Motor Vehicles famed for its Soviet-style antagonism to the public? Or would it be more like the implacable, pitiless Internal Revenue Service? In fact, the officials of the US Citizenship and Immigration Services could hardly have been more affable. The Master of Ceremonies was a genial, balding, bespectacled chap who won his audience over with a virtuoso display of multilingualism, chatting to us in what sounded like pretty fluent Spanish, Chinese, French, Hindi, and Tagalog. Yet this was very far from a multicultural occasion. Quite the reverse. To get us in the mood for our impending Americanization, a choir sang a patriotic medley, including a rather baroque setting of the preamble to the Constitution, Yankee Doodle, and Woody Guthrie's This Land Is Your Land. Well, that did it. The way that song conjures up vast American landscapes, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, always gets me by the throat, because, glimpsed in films, such vistas were what first drew me to the United States. Then came the information about our rights and obligations, specifically our right to vote, our option to obtain a passport, and our inextricable link to the social security system. Nothing, rather disappointingly, about the right to bear arms, and not a word about the spiralling federal debt we were all now on the hook for. The ceremony then became more stirring. A Faces of America video had a distinctly martial soundtrack. We raised our right hands to swear the oath of allegiance, absolutely renouncing all allegiance to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, and swearing to bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. Then we placed our right hands on our hearts to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the national flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's heady stuff, even in Oakland on a Thursday morning. And then there he was, the President of the United States himself, much larger than life on the big screen. This country is now your country, Donald Trump told us rather sternly. Our history is now your history, and our traditions are now your traditions. And that wasn't all. You now share the obligation to teach our values to others, to help newcomers assimilate 
to our way of life. Compare and contrast with the Barack Obama version. Together, we are a nation united not by any one culture or ethnicity or ideology. The grand finale was God Bless the USA, a country music anthem by Lee Greenwood made famous following the 9-11 terror attacks on New York and Washington. It too was a call to arms. And I'm proud to be an American, but at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. More than half a century of being British has made it hard for me not to cringe just a little at this kind of thing. But this hokum is now my hokum. And this president is now my president. Until such time as we the people vote in another one. Yes, I picked a fine time to become an American. Because it's always a fine time. I'm Neil Ferguson, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. I live in Guatemala and I work throughout Latin America. And I want to speak to the millions of fortunate Hispanic immigrants living in the United States, legally or not. I have a question for you. Why do you support the same policies in the US that cause you to flee your home country? The policies I'm talking about are those that lead to a bigger and bigger central government. You know only too well that the more power the government has, the more corrupt it becomes. My home country, like most other nations in Central and South America, is very poor. 54% of the population lives in poverty, and 13% live in extreme poverty. Half of all children under five are chronically malnourished. Crippling government corruption is the norm. Opening a new business can take months, even years, because of a multitude of regulations that are designed to line the pockets of bureaucrats. So the cost is much too high for the average citizen. Quite simply, unless you're politically connected in Guatemala, you probably want to leave. And in the last 20 years, many Guatemalans have left. Or to put it more honestly, they fled. The fortunate ones reached the United States, the freest and wealthiest nation in human history. There are at least one million Guatemalans living in the US. Nearly every Mexican and Central and South American immigrant in the United States whether they immigrated legally or illegally, moved or fled to the U.S. for the same reasons, economic opportunity and the freedom to shape their own lives. In short, you came to the United States to participate in what Americans call the American dream. But have you ever asked yourself, why is the United States so free, so much less corrupt and so much more affluent than any Latin American country? The answer lies first and foremost in the unique American belief in limited government. Why? Because the smaller the government, the less the corruption. And the smaller the government, the more individual freedom and personal responsibility. And given those things, along with hard work and talent, you can accomplish your life's goals. So back to my question. Why would you support policies that keep expanding the power of the government when they are the very policies that doom your home countries? Is it because you think that when Democrats offer you free stuff, it means they really care about you? Do you think that when Republicans talk about enforcing immigration laws, it means they are going to send you back? Let's be honest, you didn't come here for free stuff. You came for the economic opportunity that allows you to work and earn. And of course, a nation has an obligation to enforce its borders. Certainly, every country in Central and South America does. In fact, much more so than the US. Perhaps you believe that your home country is poor not because of failed socialism and corrupt big government, but because of issues unrelated to ideology. Not enough natural resources, imperialism, and so on. Or worse, you believe that the US has gotten rich on the backs of poor nations. But these narratives are false. There are many nations blessed with abundant natural resources that are poor. And they are poor overwhelmingly because of corrupt governments and policies that destroy incentives to produce. Look at Venezuela, which has vast oil and mineral reserves, but has shortages of every basic necessity. Why? because of socialist policies, because of those same deceiving politicians who promise to 
fight for the people, and give you free stuff. And you're going to fall for these lies again in your adopted country? Do you think by electing politicians who will fight for the people, fight for social justice, and raise taxes on the 1% who are exploiting the wealth of the 99% that you will get ahead? In other words, will you support the same policies and vote for the same types of politicians here who made such a mess back home? The United States became wealthy because its government stayed out of the way of its citizens. The more power you give to the government, the less power you have to control your own life. Prosperity and opportunity diminish as government grows. So why did you, like so many of my fellow Guatemalans, come to the US? Because your society was broken. You chose to make a new life in the United States. You could have gone to another Latin American country with a similar culture and the same language as your home country, but you didn't. Because the United States is different. Please, help keep it that way. I'm Gloria Alvarez, author of The Populist Deception for Prager University. Sweden, home to hot blondes, dead Vikings, and the Swedish chef. Now, add another thing to this list. Sweden is now the proud owner of the title, the rape capital of Europe. Sweden has always had a reputation of being a harmonious and liberal society. This image has been shattered as rape has skyrocketed over the past five years. At the same time, Sweden has been going through a revolutionary demographic shift that has seen the country take in more refugees from Islamic countries than any Western nation in the world. This immigration has led to culture clashes and to enclaves of self-contained societies across Sweden. This is Annika Henroth Rostein. She's a Swedish journalist who has extensively covered the Middle Eastern migration into Sweden. What we have is, first of all, a very, a, a Swedish culture. Then we bring in, last, like last year, 190,000 people that come from a very different culture, a culture that isn't liberal, that has radically different views on women, on sexuality, on gender, on all these things. There's an explosion. Yeah, you, it, it will be clashes. This is Rinkby, a leafy northern suburb of Stockholm, also a completely Islamic area. The police have said this is a complete no-go for them and for journalists. Here, a 60 Minutes crew from Australia is attacked while doing a story on Rinkby. In order to come here and to prosper, you have to adapt to that culture. And that, what we're doing in Europe, is the complete opposite. They are saying, how can we adapt to you? Do you think that Sweden has a responsibility to adapt to the immigrants' culture coming in? Definitely. Should a, a woman, when they come here, dress, you know, modestly, you know, with pants and with, with sleeves? Is that important? It is our culture. If you come to Rinkiby, uh, obviously, everywhere in Sweden is a dress code, you know. I got Swedish girlfriend. Sometimes I say, we go to Rinkiby, it's scared. Right. It's scared. Is it dangerous here sometimes? Mm, sometimes, yeah. We found out exactly how dangerous when while we were setting up a shoot at a neighboring location, we were approached by five men and told to leave. While my crew took off, I stayed to simply ask why we had to leave. Because I was still wired, we had the sound of what happened next. How come it's a problem to, uh, to film here? I don't want to be filmed. I know, but why? What's the? What's the? Why? I, don't, I, don't, I just don't want to spawn, you know. But why? Why? Let me see. Why? Let me see. 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 I'm not filming anything. Look, look. Show me. Show me what you got. Let go of me. Show I'll... me what you got. No, no. I'm not. Show let... me your phone. I let go. I'll show me. I don't want your phone. Show me. Let go. Let go. I was not the first person assaulted by gangs of immigrants, nor will I be the last. But women are taking the brunt of the explosion of violence across Sweden. When I went to a police station, I noticed that the vast majority of the people waiting to report a crime were women. Later, the police officer who I met with told me that most were there to report rape. 
these attacks are happening across Sweden, including a rash of rapes at music festivals. Over the past two years, dozens of young women, some as young as 12, were raped at these festivals across Sweden by hundreds of young immigrants. They use the tactic where dozens of men surround one or more girls in circles. While the men in the inner circle sexually attacks their victims, the outer circle distracts and keeps out anyone who would stop it. The attacks have become so common that some bands, most notably Mumford & Sons, refuse to play in Sweden. This has happened multiple times and to multiple victims. Then the issue is that when it is reported, this was widely known by the people who were there, the police that was on the scene, but then it was, they put the lid on it. So we- They covered it up. They covered it up. So we didn't learn about this until much, much later. While the police have told me that the majority of the people that they arrest for rape are from Islamic backgrounds, Bra, the official keeper of Swedish crime statistics, curiously dropped the background of those arrested from the official statistics. The government has failed to recognize that it's made a huge mistake. And the, the European Union has failed to recognize that it's made a huge mistake. And we have this free movement. And the movement, of course, is flowing toward the country with the most generous social benefit system. The type of benefits that immigrants receive in Sweden are significant and are all-encompassing, and include housing, food, education, and additional cash. Does the government give enough to, to the immigrants? Yeah. Everything is enough. This good world here. Yeah, life is good here. Better. Life is good. Better here. They give me a lot. They give me a house, room, clothes, uh, uh, my school. All the Swiss All government pay, pays for it. While the staggering increase in rape has made some news, this phenomenon has been coupled with a shocking and less widely reported increase in violent crime in general. Over the past couple of years, several dangerous immigrant riots have broken out, and shootings across Sweden have increased sharply. Anders Gorazin and Jacob Ekstrom are veteran and decorated policemen who have decades of experience and are tasked with policing within the immigrant community. Has there been an increase in violence and crime here in Sweden? More violence and uh, harder violence with uh, guns and... What type of weapons are you guys seeing on the streets? You can see uh, Kalashnikovs, hand grenades from the east, guns, handguns, everything you can find in Afghanistan, you can find here. Doesn't Sweden have very strict gun laws? For sure, you know, and, and we get, all the time we get new laws about guns, uh, tied it up more. Uh, and um, I, think it's, I think it's good, but you know, the, the, the violence increased anyway. This is a former police station, which had to be moved a couple of years ago. Now the police will tell you that it simply became too unsafe for them to have a full-time presence here. This man has been playing the accordion for several years, trying to bring some musical cheer to the suburb. Yet, he has faced numerous attacks. My, my music, my music, and the people, boo, 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 the police, but the, Please. You need you need the police here. Yeah, is the police? The, go back. The police here. Would you go as far as to say that these no-go areas are essentially states within a state? Yeah, most of the no-go areas is like that. Are there areas where there, if you're pursuing uh, somebody, where you'll simply stop and not pursue them once they get into this no-go area? Yeah. yeah. If uh, the police is chasing uh, uh, another car for some kind of crime. If they reach uh, what we call no areas, the police wouldn't go after it. Do you see the violence really spreading across Sweden into the cities? At least one or two times a week. And, and let's say five years ago, how often would you say it was? No. Three times a year. <laughs> really? The increase in this, in this kind of crime is exponential. I think we caught, uh, caught uh, off guard. We didn't uh, expect it to be so so much uh, so much increase. Do you think there's a deliberate attempt to cover up these type of crimes? Rather than uh, that, they they don't want to uh, seem racist. Is there a sort of sensitivity and or people scared that if you identify who's committing these type of crimes, that you could be labeled a racist? Of course, I think this is. Uh... These issues make people nervous all over the world, not only even in Sweden. This make me nervous as well. What if we're talking about that? Because you don't want to be called racist. 
no, no, this is, you know, racist card is very hard to, 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 uh, to deal with, you know. Of course, especially if you're blonde like me. And now to add to these woes, Sweden has had dozens of people go to fight for ISIS, and they're starting to come back. Sweden has had its first Islamic terrorist attack. Do you think the sexual assault problem is an Islamic problem or, or no, not? Really? No, no, no. I think it's um, a general problem among among men. Yeah, the problem isn't like this culture or that culture. The problem is male culture. I don't think the immigrant is the problem. No, it's not. Like that's just a, like a tiny, tiny bit of the problem. And like when that happen happens, like it's because we didn't like uh, bring. Uh, bring them in in the right way. And I don't do see that connection at all. And don't. I would very much like to see the evidence of such a connection. Do you think it's, it's almost racist to make that connection? Yes, I think so. Is there a point where you think that Sweden has done too much to bring people in? Or do you think there's... No, there is no too much in helping people. And is there a limit, do you think, to how many immigrants Sweden can take? No, no. The civilization born of Judeo-Christian values, ancient Greek philosophy, and the discoveries of the Enlightenment is staring at the abyss brought there by its own hand. To put it starkly, Europe is committing suicide. How did this happen? It's a complicated story, but there are two major causes. The first is the mass movement of peoples into Europe. This has been going on steadily since the end of World War II, but sped up massively in the migration crisis of 2015 when more than a million migrants poured into Europe from the Middle East, North Africa and East Asia. The second, and equally significant, is that Europe lost faith in itself, its beliefs, its traditions, and even its very legitimacy. Let's take a closer look at both causes. For decades, Europe encouraged people, mostly from the Middle East and North Africa, to come as temporary workers. Nobody expected them to stay, yet they did. And nobody asked them to leave, even those who came illegally. As one British immigration minister put it in 1999, removal takes too long and it's emotional. And, of course, why would they leave? The economic opportunities were far greater in Europe than from where they came, and if the work dried up, there were generous welfare benefits to be had. For a time, immigrants were allowed, even encouraged, thanks to the European commitment to multiculturalism, to pursue whatever culture they wanted. But that didn't work out well. The leaders of Britain, France and Germany admitted as much in 2011 when David Cameron, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel dramatically announced that multiculturalism had failed. So, the immigrants were then asked to assimilate and embrace Western values. If that happened, European governments reasoned, all the financial costs, even the occasional acts of terrorism, could be overlooked. But it never happened, and immigration just increased. During 2015, Germany and Sweden added 2% to their populations in a single year. By 2017, the most popular boy's name in the United Kingdom was Mohammed. So, why did European leaders decide Europe could take in anyone in the world, whether fleeing war or simply seeking a better life, no matter how different or even opposed their values were to European values? The one word answer to this question is guilt. Aren't these refugees, the thinking goes, fleeing the consequences of European imperialism? Didn't we mercilessly exploit these unfortunate people in their home countries? Aren't we the cause of their misery? Accepting them into Europe is meant to be a wiping away of this guilt. This is especially true of Germany. In allowing one and a half million people into her country in 2015, Angela Merkel was, in effect, proclaiming to the world that Germany, the great aggressor of the 20th century, the architect of the Holocaust, would be the humanitarian superpower of the 21st. A noble sentiment, perhaps, but who pays the price? the ordinary citizens of Europe, who've seen crime and terrorism increase exponentially. Their fears and frustrations have been largely ignored, or worse. In October 2015, the German government designated that 800 newly arrived immigrants were to be housed in the German town of Kassel. 
Concerned residents had a meeting to ask questions of their representatives. As a video recording shows, that his citizens were calm and polite. And then, at a certain point, their district president informs them that the refugees are coming regardless of their objections, and anyone who does not agree with the policy is free to leave Germany. This official attitude, if there is a problem, it's not with the refugees but with the citizens, reflects a sense of what I call tiredness. A feeling among the elite class that the European story has played out, that we've tried religion and all imaginable forms of politics, and that each has one after another led us to disaster. We taint every idea we touch, so who's to say that the world wouldn't be better off without us? Of course, only people who have no idea how lucky they are could take this view. Ironically, no one knows this better than those refugees who truly did assimilate and who defend Western values. Extraordinary people like Somali-born Ayan Hersiali, who left the Netherlands because she believed in the principles of the Enlightenment more than the Dutch did. Or Hamid Abdel Samid in Germany, whose life is threatened by fellow immigrants because he defends European values. This is the stuff of suicide the self-annihilation of a culture. It is possible that ordinary Europeans will join their leaders in this pact, but recent opinion polls suggest that they have no intention of doing so. How they act on that intention will be the great story of the years ahead. Are we about to witness the end of Europe or its rebirth? I'm Douglas Murray, author of The Strange Death of Europe, for Prager University. What's up, guys? This is Will Witt from PragerU. Today we're at the Keeping Families Together March here in downtown LA, and we're going to see what the people are marching about. Hitler was trying to put himself in place of God. That's what Trump is doing. Do you think we should have open borders? Well, the borders are kind of a construct, so in a sense they are open. What does your sign mean? Um, it's abolish ICE, abolish Trump, and Ivanka Trump's a complicit do you think we should build a wall? No. Why not? It's unnecessary. Il Duce, Mussolini, um, Hitler, Stalin, um, Putin, any of these guys, Pol Pot, Trump, yeah, they're all birds of a feather. We don't have accurate information. We do not have a democracy. For that, I do not forgive Trump. Do you guys think we should have open borders? I think personally we should. I have stopped coloring my hair ever since Hillary got the big FU from the American people. I. I don't color my hair anymore. Well, you look fantastic. <laughs> it's because of my sign. Should we have open borders? Yes. We, we, we know borders in all the world. What does your sign mean? Uh, it says ICE is a terrorist organization. If someone crosses the border illegally, what should we do with the child? Keep them with a family. And just let them into the country? Yes. Okay. So we shouldn't build a wall? Why not? Because it's shown that it doesn't work. If that's the case, then everyone should have a wall up. Everyone should have a wall up. That's why celebrities have walls around their homes, so that people can't get in. True. But if... True. <laughs> okay. This separating children from their families is a horrible thing. And it was happening under Obama as well. So it's not just Trump's fault, right? Um, if, uh, Grant, well, I would... And why should we abolish ICE? ICE is tearing families apart. It's, it, it's a pointless kind of program. There's a longer conversation we can have about my opinion about the Native Americans, and I think what, was hap what happened to them was extremely tragic, and that is also a form of terrorism. Yes, I think that the land belongs to the Natives. So we should give it back to them? Absolutely. So we should leave? Yeah. When are we flying out? right now. <laughs> okay. What's up Gators? This is Will Witt with PragerU. Today we're at the University of Florida and we're asking people about ice and we also ran into a little climate change protest. <laughs> Let's do it. What are your thoughts on ice? On ice? Oh, it's... Honestly, I don't know that much information about it, but I know it's like... I feel like it's kind of unfair. Um, I think ice, it, like currently right now in this political administration, they're doing more harm than good. Under the current, like, political climate, I don't really agree with, like, a lot of their policies. You hate ICE? Yes. 
Why do you hate ICE? Because I think that that's ridiculous that you're going to block out people that coming into the country that we are founded on immigrants. So how are you going to take them out? Yeah, take yeah. them out. Do you think there's a difference between legal immigrants and illegal immigrants? For sure, but I don't think that it's right to build a wall. What do you guys think about ICE? Well, it is a naturally occurring phenomenon on Earth, and it exists in the poles seasonally. That's true. That's true. Put in your drink. I like it. Do you think illegal immigration is a big problem? Like you talk about education and stuff, and illegal immigrants take advantage of these programs that the taxpayers pay for? I don't think Ill illegal immigrants take advantage of things like free health care, free education, by any means. Do you think there's a difference though between legal and illegal immigration? Um, I mean, it's like, yeah, like, textbook definition, yes, there's um, a difference between legal and illegal. What are your thoughts on ICE? Um, I mean, they keep illegal immigration to a minimum, and that's good. Uh, can be a little aggressive sometimes, like some of the things that they do are inhumane, like separating them from their children. It's just not the right way to go about things. I, I think that if you don't want to be separated from your children, you shouldn't try and cross the border illegally, right? I agree, you should try to get here legally. Yeah. What do you think about ICE? The organization? They're just doing their job. Uh, I, I like the organization a lot. I think it's really important to maintaining a free state that we enforce the laws of our country. The guys are just like cops. They got to do their job. So they get a lot of hate because it's easy to hate on them. In a way, that job in itself in every country is a necessary job. Immigration is an issue because uh, we, can't, we can't support the entire world in our country. Um, but We can. We need to just have open borders and let everyone in, okay? Who's going to pay for that? In general, many elements of the left are against the concept of like a nation state. Go on a waiting list for a few years, maybe get denied, maybe get in. That just lay the land, you know, it's how it's supposed to work. We are here because we believe that climate change is an important issue that impacts all of us. And we want to highlight the important intersection that holds with immigration. Which is why we will continue to show up until our university, our government, and our country understand that. <laughs> Climate change. Climate change has no borders. Okay? It's open borders, climate change. Aren't you the Antifa? Not to talk to him. You were the, at the Antifa table the other day, right? Uh, but yeah, just uh, <laughs> says not to talk <laughs> so to him. That's a yes. <laughs> you think climate change affects immigration? Climate change will be the world's most awful leveler. It will force 100 million people out of Bangladesh. It'll force 5 million people out of South Florida. It'll force millions of people out from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, climate migration is definitely a thing. It doesn't matter so much whether it's legal. Or, I mean, it does matter if it's legal or illegal. It's just more so that people are literally losing their homes, whether it's rising sea level or climate change or natural disasters just making where they currently live, like, not a thing anymore. Where do you see, like, the rising sea levels and natural disasters destroying homes? All over the world, realistically. In the 70s, they thought it was going to be an ice age. They thought it was going to be the opposite. Like Al Gore said, that like polar bears would be dead by this point now. Now there are more. Seriously. There are more polar bears now than there were when Al Gore said that. No. Yes. No. But go ahead. You can argue. So your science says what? That this isn't happening. This is not of a worry. No, no, not at all. So not at all. What's your I, answer? Well, I'm more of the sense that the free market is is more in tune to help. Really enough. Like the flash drive, right? This was like eco-capitalism that saved right. millions of trees because you have a flash drive that you can put files on. It's right, like a wonderful right. thing, right? And to me, it's sad that uh, something like climate change has been politicized and it's turned into what it is. But because well, I'm a I'm a more conservative person, it's like yeah. people think that I just hate the environment because no. I'm a conservative. No. And it's like that's not the case at all. It's sad that. Yeah, they know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sad that it's like. You gotta defend them. I mean, our climate and our system is always changing. That's just how the planet functions, you know, whether it was the age of the dinosaurs or the ice age. I mean, that's just biologically how our planet functions as a whole. And so it's normal that it goes through changes and things like that. So, and so it's normal that it goes through changes and things like that. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's fun. What's up guys? This is Will Witt with PragerU. Today we're on Alvera Street for a pro caravan march here in Los Angeles. We're going to talk to the people here, see where they're marching, and see what they think about the caravan. Let's do it. So I believe that people have the right to be here, be on this land, just like they did 500 years ago. We are not putting up with illegal aliens from Europe 
telling us what to do on our land. What is the meaning of the sage? It's California white sage, and it's to take away all negativity and to purify the area. Brothers and sisters, come together and fight the real enemy. And that's, that's the right. invaders from across the ocean that do not belong here. See it? You guys got to start thinking this way. Mass migration calls us to mobilize for communism. So we're for a system without borders, without nations, without, without capitalists, without money. We learned from the Russian and the Chinese revolution that the next, the next revolution has to be for communism. Didn't like a hundred million people die during communist revolution? Where? In Russia and China? No, it's not true. It lies. Okay. See, it. you guys got to start thinking this way. I asked you if you're pro-racist, because the are pro-racist. Why are we, I don't know wait, about how that. How is that? Okay. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! Just a question. Did your guys' parents, grandparents, did they come in illegally or legally? Do you know? Uh, I have to ask, but um, I, I think for the most part, they, they probably we intend here a plurinational California Republic. Yeah, Trump is an a yeah. mole. But so was Obama. Yeah. So was Clinton. The solution is simple. Besides the destruction of the empire, these people are, there's one of them there. They are, they're the modern day Gestapo. Yeah. If you don't know what the Gestapo is, that was the, the police of the Nazis. Yeah. And as a history teacher, I teach my, my students about World War II and the Nazis and all that. See it, you guys gotta start thinking this way. You are imperialist number one terrorist! All right, guys, we just finished up here at the pro-refugee, pro-caravan, and honestly, just pro-communism march. This is the leftist future that they want. This is what we're up against, guys. Share this video, share PragerU videos, get them out to people. We need people to be educated or the left is going to take over this country and this is going to be the future that we have in America. Guys, thank you so much. Follow me on social media at, Will, at the Will Wit and at PragerU. See you guys next time. See it, you guys gotta start thinking this way. Aloha everyone, that's Hawaiian for What's Up Guys, this is Will Witt from PragerU. Today we're in Waikiki Beach talking to people about illegal immigration and whether Hawaii should be a sanctuary state. Let's do it. What are your views on illegal immigration? Um, well, I wouldn't call it illegal to begin with. It's, oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. This isn't the land of the people who claim for it to be illegal. So, yeah, I think that term in and of itself is problematic. The natives in America are not immigrants. The natives of Hawaii are not immigrants. You guys like Starbucks? I love Starbucks. Yeah. It's great. I do really appreciate Capitalism. it. Capitalism. Starbucks. No, capitalism <laughs> and the corporate world. <laughs> yeah. So like if someone from, I guess, let's say like the Philippines came to Hawaii, immigrated here, um, but didn't become a citizen, is that illegal? Um, I mean, yes, it is illegal, but I think it's important to note that the people who decide what is legal and what isn't, like, are not indigenous to Hawaii either. Do you think Hawaii should be like a sanctuary state? Um... So in support of having a sanctuary in the U.S., but I think Hawaii is a bad place yeah, because not Hawaii. I mean, ideally, I think every state should be a sanctuary state. I feel like it's already kind of overpopulated. The That's local community idea. here, yeah, like, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea to ha to send more people here. Mm -hmm. Locals like, don't want illegal immigrants here. No, no, no not, that's not it. it. It's like. It's not that they don't want illegal immigrants, it's that like everyone's already coming here yeah. and kind of taking over. If people are interested in coming into our borders, there's just a process that has to be followed. Do you think it's, it's fair for people who, like illegal immigrants who come, to get benefits from the government if they don't pay taxes like we do? Oh, this is That's a hard <laughs> one. Oh, he hit it. Um, um. What do you think about that? Is that right? Of course not. They got to pay dues. I mean, some people take it for take advantage because we, you know, Americans, we're the nicest people in the world. I think we give too much a lot of times, but, um, you know, that's what makes us a good country. It's like a double-edged sword. We want you to come, but don't come over here bring it and killing people. You think it's okay for those illegal immigrants to come to the rest of the USA, just not Hawaii? Honestly, 
Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Honestly, yeah. It's not really an immigration conversation. It's kind of a racist conversation, I think, is what we have to realize. And it has nothing to do with really... It's not... Nothing to do with the race. Right or wrong. No, no, of course not. It's right or wrong. We're a great country, and I think people need to, to really respect it and not take advantage of it. And, yeah, it's wrong if they come over here illegally, and they're not going to contribute. I couldn't be the president. <laughs> I definitely uh, couldn't. Can I somebody say action? Action. Quiet on the set. Hey, it's Rock Me Ronnie. I'm here with the guy I've been telling you about. He's known from coast to coast like butter and toast. How many you got? 150 million viewers? That's right. Oh my God, see that? And you didn't think I knew that. We are talking to people today about illegal immigration and why Hawaii should not be a sanctuary state. That's the main gist of today. I'm with you, brother. Who's your there president? Trump, Donald Trump. Can I get a hoo-ha? Hoo-ha! For Donald Trump. For Donald Trump, baby. Yeah. Thank you so much for helping me film. You want to introduce yourself to everyone? My name is Tiana Ilasara, and it was an honor to host Will Witt here in Hawaii, where I am born and raised. So thank you so much for getting the Hawaii perspective out there. Thank you. And you're a member of Prager Force too? Definitely. Love yeah. Prager Force. Yeah. So our student program with PragerU, you can check PragerU.com to join. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. So the people today were great people. We found some leftists who did not like our views on immigration very much, but that's why the whole country is going downhill, because of leftists with these kind of views. So it's up to us as conservative people to try and change them. Thank you guys so much for watching. Share this video with your friends. Follow me and PragerU on social media. See you in the next one. Peace. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha. Can I get a hoo-ha? Hoo-ha!